I am introducing uh, our uh, representative John Katko from the 24th District of New York. He is the new ranking minority member on Homeland Security. So he's got a lot of work in front of him. Just a little bit about his background, which I found fascinating because I'm a huge fan of narcos. Uh, is before he uh, joined Congress in 2014, he was a uh, federal prosecutor, first as a senior trial attorney at the Security and Exchange Commission, and then he spent 20 years as an assistant attorney general in the Department of Justice, where he actually was down in El Paso and did some time in Puerto Rico. So as much as I love to talk about cybersecurity, uh, I also know that bad guys are bad guys, and they tend to have similar uh, patterns in their behavior. So I'm I'm very glad to know we have somebody who really has is steeped in this area now looking at the area of cyber. So, Congressman, um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I don't see you on the screen. Do we have him up here, Jack? Got Can it. you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay, he also okay. is, is so tech savvy. He's doing this from his his phone because he, he doesn't, did you say you don't have Wi-Fi in your office today, uh, Congressman? <laughs> Syracuse office, they never got Wi-Fi, got it, and, and they didn't have it, so we're dealing with it. So, but that will be fixed. Okay, well, as I said, God bless mobile. It still works. We have options. So let's start with um, solar winds. You know, happened in December, gave a lot of people a new perspective on the challenges that we have in the cyber arena. And one of the areas is the conflation between what we can we might call the dot gov space, which is the federal government and sometimes state and local and uh, and commercial, and how we're doing information sharing, which brings us to uh, uh, the the cyber element of homeland security. How is it going with CISA, and what are you thinking moving into this uh, this new area in 2021? Well, I, I really think that the solar winds uh, a debacle, for lack of a better term, has pointed up a lot of the vulnerabilities with our current uh, makeup uh, of cybersecurity. And in the .gov domain, it, it's it, it's clear that we don't really have a truly defined quarterback. CISA uh, it should be the quarterback of, a, of about 101 agency team of the .gov domain. And uh, it's, there's too much, too much there's, there's not enough centralization for that effort. And I, and I like to describe CISA, what I'd like to see him become is the quarterback of that team, not in charge of everyone telling everybody, you know, uh, in charge of everybody, but helping them uh, move the ball forward and uh, help them with their cybersecurity. But we don't, we need that centralization, I think is something that's really lacking. And I came up with a five point, five pillars, if I, I if you will, of things I think we need to do in this domain and in light of what happened with solar winds and, and the vulnerabilities to our system that I highlighted. So if you want to go through those. Yes, please, Let's, we'd love to hear all five. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we seriously need to, need to rethink our fragmented approach to the .gov security by centralizing authority with CISA. That means not, it's not taking the authority away from the other agencies, but just centralizing the authority and having, having a, a, a good clearinghouse as, who stands as the, um, the, the good advisor for uh, the entire cyber realm of the .gov domain. Second, we need to better understand the nature and extent of third-party cyber risks. Uh, so, SolarWinds was a third-party uh, uh, software that uh, had an unbelievably open back door mm -hmm. and uh, no one really heard of cyber our solar winds uh, is as little as two months ago, and now it's kind of a household name, and not for a good reason. So uh, we need to understand the, the third-party cyber risk better. Third, once we identify the potentially uh, concentrated sources of the cyber risk, I think we need to ensure we have a better vendor certification process that actually reduces that risk. And I, you know, I'm thinking about the uh, Federal Acquisition Security Council and doing, doing a better job with that. Um, but we can't stop there. Uh, the fourth thing is it's it's imperative that we drive better software assurance practices, and we need a system to prevent software flaws from causing widespread harm. Anytime you put an update on your system, you're creating a vulnerability, and there's no way we can have a oversight of every single piece of code, but we need to start thinking better about uh, software assurance practices that are better than they have right now. And lastly, we need to whack the hell out of the bad guys when they commit these acts like solar wind. And, and, and what happened with, with uh, Russia, we all know it was Russia. And uh, to, to, to my knowledge, nothing has happened yet from an offensive uh, standpoint. And we need to do that. From a sanction standpoint, we need to do that. From an indictment standpoint, we need to do that. We need to let them know that, you know, this isn't just an open field here. But make no mistake about it, one of the overarching things I've seen is it's clear that uh, Russia and China and the other bad actors in Iran are putting far more resources into their offensive capabilities than we are into our, our defensive capabilities. And until we start leveling the playing field, we're gonna have a hard time trying to keep our system safe going forward. 
So the last administration did spend quite a bit of time in the interagency process working through the supply chain security problems. Do you see that moving forward as we go into the Biden administration? I hope so. Uh, I hope we haven't stopped that progress. We definitely made progress with CISTA in the last administration, but it's still not anywhere near where it needs to be. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm a conservative. I don't like spending money. But at the same token, uh, uh, if we don't spend this money on CISA and we don't get CISA where it needs to be and give them the tools and the resources that they need, there's just no way we're going to be able to do, uh, uh, do what we need to do. It, it's clear to us there's much more that needs to be done. And uh, we've got we've to um, uh, give them the tools to do it. Well, we've you know encouraged so many people to go to the cloud, and there's so many amazing things that the cloud can do. And on one level is it can it can it can protect you. This group yesterday was also online, and there was a lot of chatter in the chat. You know, internet's down. It wasn't really the internet as people think of it as one piece, but knowing the layers of the stack. And one of them was actually you know Amazon was having some issues with AWS, and so we did see some websites go down. So it was a little moment of panic, but we all got through it. But I think your point about the third party risks are really um, important. So do you th think that we need to re really look at procurement as far as the federal government and the IT and what we'll call the job space to ensure that we have the throughput of security ideas? You mentioned software, but there's many other elements to that as well. Absolutely. I mean, just look, just look at it from a, just a practical standpoint. Um, gone are the days where cybersecurity was basically uh, the mission was to just get a patch to fix a cyber vulnerability. It's much more ubiquitous than that now. Now, the Internet of Things, uh, in, your, in your home, you have 30, 40 devices. And I, I just think back of the best example I can think of, and the most uh, one you would never think is a cyber issue, is buying subways in New York City. Uh, the, the New York governor, in his infinite wisdom, uh, or lack thereof, uh, had a, a low bidder process for the, for, for the subway, for subway trains in New York City. Well, we all know that China uh, unfairly supports their subway manufacturing uh, uh, facilities. So they are automatically gonna be the lowest bidder, I think. And they get the contract, but no one thought to stop to think and say, okay, all the Wi-Fi that's transacted on those trains is probably got, is Chinese software that's probably embedded with spyware. And what are we doing? Why are we, why are we making anybody who transacts on that network vulnerable to hacking? Um, those are the types of things you got to think about. It's a much more complicated world. So from an acquisition standpoint, the 5G technology and everything else, it's just amazing to me that people are still doing business with uh, uh, the, the, the 5Gs, uh, the Chinese 5G manufacturers when we know that what they're doing with, their, with those systems. So uh, there's a lot, uh, it's a lot more of a ubiquitous problem than just thinking, uh, keeping your computer safe. Everything's tied to the internet. Everything's got computers in it. Uh, like, uh, so many devices talk to each other every day. People don't realize the vulnerabilities we're creating by that. So the idea of a national uh, cyber director, how do you see them collaborating with CISA? Are they at the top of the pyramid? Are they just part of the centralization? Do you have an idea how that process might work? I, I, no doubt in my mind that uh, we badly need a, a national cybersecurity director. It, it came out of the cyber solarium, and it's something we absolutely um, uh, uh, we absolutely have to have. And I view them as being just what they should be. They're the total center fielder. If CISA is the quarterback of the .gov domain, then, of course, we have the Department of Defense, uh, the quarterback of the .mil domain. Uh, this, the CISA, cyber, the, I mean, the cyber director has got to be the one above all that looking out over the entire playing field and saying, what are, what, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What do we need to do? And that person should be the person I think should, that should be giving advice on how bad um, uh, attacks are on us and what we should be doing in return, et cetera. So I think I view that role as a very important role, not just a figurehead role at all. It's not a ministerial role. And I, I liken it to um, back in the days when, you, when they formed the Office of National Drug Con Control Policy when I was an organized crime prosecutor. Um, we had a, tons of disparate agencies involved in drug enforcement, and rightly so, FBI, DEA, Customs, uh, be, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearm. You needed that. You needed that quarterback. You needed that individual kind of was that's above it all. And the ONDCP person was the one, and it was really good. So, uh, and I, I envision a similar role for the, for the um, cyber director. That, actually, back in that same time period, we had a challenge with the Coast Guard because everybody was like, "Are they drug you know, Are they part of the military? They were yeah. technically part of the tra transportation at the time." And I see CISA kind of in the digital role, the same thing where everybody wants a little bit of them, but nobody wants full ownership. Uh, and so I think having a full ownership and giving them responsibilities would be huge, especially on information sharing, because that seems yeah. to be the, 
friction point that we're, we're not getting through. You just on it, and that's that's what I meant to say. Uh, this, this term silos, it's overused to some extent, but boy, in the intel field and, and the counterterrorism field, it was a real problem before 9-11, obviously. And that's what the 9-11 Commission exposed. And really, I think we're having similar problems. I don't think it's as acute as it was back then. Uh, for not for the side but for counterterrorism but it still has silos and when people are trying to protect their turfs instead of doing what's right to help the team as a whole um or un unwittingly having silos up because they just don't they're, they're not used to uh sharing the information and trusting the sharing of the information that's a problem but the task force concept that, that was born out of 9 11 the jttfs and we, where we have that in the cyber cyber realm it needs to be better and we need to make sure that um, the information that's being generated is, is being shared and, and, and being, and everyone's basically playing nice in the sandbox, quite frankly, we need that as well. We mentioned sanctions and there's always been the challenge with cyber treaty that what is first amendment rights for someone is their right to say no to information flow. But, you know, how, how do we, plus we also had, uh, Chris Painter was in the Obama administration was very good, but he moved, they moved the position from the white house to the state department, which made it very diplomatic, but not necessarily having the backing of the, the criminal effects that we needed. You mentioned needing a financial cost to um, you know, make them understand that we're serious about not wanting them messing with our systems. Do you have some ideas on how you want to implement that? Uh, yeah, I think the cyber director is going to have to play a role in that. There's no question about it. But I, the bottom line is, uh, when we when we know someone has done something like they have done solar winds, there needs to be very serious consequences from an economic standpoint, and maybe uh, maybe uh, utilizing offensive cyber capabilities if 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 the, if the powers that be deem that necessary. I'm not saying that should be not every single case, but. There's a lot of times we know who the bad actors are. And, and, and you know what? Uh, indictments, people laugh about indictments in the past. And we snagged people on uh, international criminal organizations they thought we'd never get because we had them indicted already. And when they, they traveled internationally, we were able to grab them. And so um, I think we should use all the tools in our toolbox to let them know that when you do something like you did with solar winds, there's going to be a heavy price. So you can try it. But if you are, if you get caught, we're going to whack you hard, and I think that's really what's lacking here to some extent. This is a little more parochial, but with COVID and so many people working from home, and especially the um, federal government, have you have we seen lessons learned? Do we have a challenge from? This is actually more on the administrative side of of having our government now working from their their um, home computers or possibly not their work computers, and how we make sure that they are not the point of vulnerability going forward. I, I think. Abilities have uh, metastasized because of uh, remote remote working. You know, let, let's face it. I mean, um, I, there's just that much more uh, people working on uh, that, what they think may be secure networks. But you know, there's more laptop news. There's more. There's more stuff out there in the cloud. There's more, more everything going on. And I think that to me, um, the problem has metastasized much like it has with respect to like the Internet of Things, like I was talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. It's just. I think it's not, it's not going away. I think it's here to stay. I think remote working and tel telecommuting is here to stay. I also think uh, tele telehealth and telemedicine and telecounseling and all those things are here to stay. I know that because of legislation I've introduced. So we've got to start thinking about protecting all that as well. And that's why um, uh, understanding what solar winds represents just from one, one vulnerability standpoint, uh, it's symptomatic of a much larger problem. We've got to understand that. So again, a little on the parochial side, but going to Congress, when they originally were looking at, you know, post 9 11 cyber being a very minor part of this, there were about 132 points of jurisdiction. Have they been able to contain, are you now with your subcommittee on cyber on Homeland, do you feel like you have enough jurisdiction, you don't have to deal with as much cross-functional, you know, interagency problems still exist, but getting Congress to speak with one voice on cyber seems to be a key. Well, no, here's the problem. Uh, when, you know, the, one of the, one of the, un, uh, unachieved uh, goals of the 9-11 Commission was to have more jurisdiction within the Ho Homeland Security Committee. It just hasn't happened. Every For the vast majority of things to do, do on Homeland Security and cyber included, uh, there's several other jurisdictions, perhaps ENC, maybe a, a government reform and oversight and some others that, that are going to have their uh, their hand in the pot as well. And it leads to very, it makes it very difficult to get legislation through. And there's too many unnecessary um, turf battles, if you will, and competing interests. We are the, we are the committee that is, that is charged with keeping the, the homeland safe. And the cyber component of that is very serious. And that's why I think uh, I, I could care less about 
who gets watered turf. I'm just saying from a logical standpoint, cybersecurity is within our realm. CISA is within Homeland Security. And we should be the primary jurisdiction for that, if not the sole jurisdiction, from a keeping our country safe standpoint. And I know there's other ju- other components elsewhere, but we have jurisdiction over, I think, six or seven different committees at least. And that's that. not, not, not many other agencies have that kind of a problem. And that's a real problem for trying to... Um, Get, get CISA up and running to where it needs to be. There's, there's, there's very few people in the cyber realm that would disagree with us that uh, uh, CISA needs to be beefed up more in light of what's happened with solar winds. Uh, and I know that we are specifically talking about cyber, but are there other areas you want to let us know as you guys go into your new Congress? You've got new members on the committee. Um, what are priorities coming into the first couple of months here? Well, there's a lot. I mean, uh, some of the other things we got to talk about is uh, uh, CISA was granted a bunch of new authorities in the NDAA, uh, and we've got to be we got to make sure we do proper oversight of that for sure. We got, like I said, we got to make sure that CISA is fully resourced. That's going to be a big issue. Election security uh, that might be a big issue, right? Uh, right, right. Uh, and uh, I think doing some postmortems on where some of the f- shortcomings were. I mean, in New York State, uh, New York 22, we still don't have a, 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 a member of Congress for that race. And then we may not for several months because of everything going on. We got to do a better job with election oversight. We need to beef up the election oversight area. Um, our cybersecurity workforce, uh, there's workforce shortages in the cyber field are, are at a critical level now. We need to address that. Uh, ransomware attacks are, are becoming a big issue. Uh, the 5G uh, technology is a big issue that we need to uh, do. And I think clarifying federal roles and responsibilities to prevent uh, uh, counterproductive encroachment on CISA's mission. I mean, I just read recently where state is beefing up their whole cybersecurity uh, arm, and they have a very different interest. Um, they're, 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 the intersection for them is, is, is not uh, keeping Homeland safe, that's a component of what they consider, but diplomacy is also part of it. I'm not sure cybersecurity and diplomacy uh, um, uh, are a good mixture. And I think when you're making decisions on cybersecurity, they should be based on cybersecurity. So that's a pretty good example. So from a cyber realm, those are the things we're working for. Oh, Congressman, we just lost your, your video. We, oh, there you are. Okay. Um, you're getting audio. Good. How's that? <laughs> Dead at them. Right. Well, yeah, uh, as far as the State Department and I mean, the multilateral, we've seen uh, different ways around this, but there's there's definitely a need uh, to figure out how we go after the bad guys and how we keep, uh, you know, in communications. There's one of the books I pulled this morning just because I love the statistic. And then thinking about the work that you've done previously, uh, one of the guys in Mexico, they when they they caught him, he had two hundred million dollars in his house, which at the time was twice of what they were spending on Interpol for drug interdiction. I mean, it's just we've never right. quite got the numbers right and then figured out the you know, the jurisdiction battle are one, the getting the authorization into the right place so then they have permission and then making sure that we actually fund it. it and it is, you know, by IT equipment, like to think kind of has a, it, it times out quickly. And one of the great things about actually 5G and what we're seeing go forward is hopefully that will be faster to do that on a software level and we won't have to spend as much money on hardware. Um, but that's, you know, that, that's a never ending battle. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, it's, but if you really, if you just stop and think about it fundamentally, okay, you have, um, you have the bad guys over here, and they're spending, let's just throw a number out there, $50 billion a year for offensive cyber capabilities. And we're over here spending a mere fraction of that. They're going to kick our butts every time because they're going to be able to continue to do it because they have the resources to do it. Um, I'm not saying we need to be at level with them, but we need to understand there's a gigantic disparity between their offensive capabilities and our defensive capabilities. And we need, and CISA is part of that, Department of Defense is part of that in a dot mil uh, domain. And uh, there's a lot of things we can be doing uh, that we need to be doing, and we need to be doing it by uh, um, beefing it up and also making sure we have a cyber director. I think it's critically important. Well, I think I'm glad you brought up workforce because that's that's a huge issue, too, is we just have such a dearth of people that have the, the collective skills. I always think it's a little bit like how we um, pull the a lot of our pilots come out of the military, which is great. I feel safe on American flights, but uh, we can only train so many people in the um, in the. Uh, to go to NSA and all these different agencies, and we need to find a way to make sure that we're getting the pipeline filled with people that don't necessarily have to have military grade. They, they, you know, they can be great at that, but we have a lot of areas where we just need people to understand how that how that information flows and get it to the right person. So you know, yeah, is, is, not everybody needs to have a, a master's degree or a doctorate to do this either. Right. I mean, 
that's one of the things we got to understand. And I think one of the things we're going to have to do, and we've already started doing that, is we start got to start drilling down into high school, maybe in the mid, middle school level with curriculum. And it really is going to be that basic, getting people to understand and, uh, and understand the lucrative careers that are out there. I mean, if you're if you're in the cyber domain right now, you're a, basically a, a, a much sought after free agent. Uh, and uh um, we've got to. We've just got to understand. We've got to get more people in that field. We got to incentivize them to go into that field for sure. Yeah, there's um, actually one of my. Uh, I just talked to Mika Young, who's going to be over at the uh, deputy assistant director, sorry, De- deputy assistant secretary of defense, and she just started a new podcast called um, "To Catch a Hacker." And it really is. It's like the, there's so many good stories that are real. You don't even bother to make fiction out of them. You just follow yes. what's going on. And uh, trying to figure out how to make that excitement understandable as an actual career would be a, a huge boon to getting more kids interested in going this direction, definitely. It, it really is. Those, hack- those hackathons and things are actually really, uh, really useful to, to recruit talent. They're very, very good. Yes, this organization also does a lot of work with the Congressional App Challenge, which I'm sure your office is, yep. is working with. Uh, I'm getting a one-minute warning. Any last thoughts before we sign off? Yeah, listen, I mean, um, I, I do think um, if you wanted to say um, one thing in particular, uh, it, it's that we have to understand that cybersecurity is not, like I said earlier, it's not about just fixing the patches anymore. It's interwoven with every fabric of our business and every fabric of our society, from medicine to, to, uh, to our, our, our homes, to our businesses. Every, everything is tied to the Internet, and we got to understand that it's much, much uh, bigger and much more complex problem than than uh, than just keeping a system uh, safe. It's much more difficult, and I think that it requires a very significant response. And uh, Benny Thompson and I are committed to uh, raising that as I uh, um, going forward. To raising well, that as an issue, Congressman, we wish you a lot of luck. I'm sure a lot of people watching this would love to come in and talk to you about what's what's important in this area. And we are here. And we wish you a a, a great next Congress going in. And thank you for being with us today. Let's hope it ends better than it started. (laughs) Absolutely. That way. All right.